Hi everyone, hope you're fine. Startup Garden is the world's largest community of startups, founders, innovators, and curators. We bring like-minded yet diverse individuals like you together through our events, flagship conferences, and startup programs. We believe in making friends, not contacts. We believe in giving and not taking, and we believe in helping others before helping yourself. Through our events and online content, collectively, we are reaching over 3.5 million individuals worldwide. This is our first podcast at a startup Grand Warsaw. Hope you're safe and happy wherever you are. Like every month, we're supposed to organize an event with our guest speaker and have networking to see each other face to face. But due to lockdown and practicing social distancing, we came up with a new format and decided to start a podcast. This way you have the chance to enjoy the conversation in the comfort of your home. We're looking forward to hearing your feedback and I really hope you enjoy this conversation. Hi, Ola. Uh, hi, Ahmad. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, very well. How about you? I can hear you as well. Oh, perfect. So thank you very much for giving us your time. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, I think at the beginning, it would be very good if you can just uh, introduce yourself and then, you know, like we'll just take it from there. Mm, sure. Um, my name is Ola Lazar and uh, I run a food tech accelerator and uh, platform for the food and uh, Horeca industries, uh, which is called Food Forward. That's what, what I currently do. Perfect. But, uh, you know, like if you want to go a little bit um, deeper into the whole history and everything is like how did your whole journey started um it started a while ago first of all uh i have a i would i would call myself a a food person with a business background so i've always been very much interested in all things relating to food uh but as far as my education is concerned, I, I chose to go to a business school. I went to Warsaw School of Economics. And uh, straight after that, I went to work in the corporate world, in Citibank and Canal Plus. And um, this is where I realized that actually my true calling was, was food. And at first, uh, my idea was to, to be a, a food writer. So... Uh, mm, since 2005, I've been um, writing about food. I was a cookbook author at first, and then I founded um, a hugely popular site, which was called Gastronauci PL, which was a, um, a restaurant guide for Poland, which I ran for eight years until the year 2014. And ever since, I've been working with startups who are in the field of food, food tech, and also a little bit retail and stuff like that. So this is like the brief, brief version of, of things. But wasn't that like a scary thing to go from a corporate life, from the banking sector, and then try to only focus on the food part? Um, sure, it was. Uh, but I just felt like it's now or never and uh, um, that I, it was like a classic situation of those like I thought if I don't do it I will regret it uh, for sure and maybe I will not regret it if I do it so I went for it basically um, yeah the life of no regrets <laughs> uh, well you know uh, trying trying to, to to live that way yeah definitely very good and in the meanwhile, you also wrote a cookbook, right? Yeah, it, actually, um, I wrote a couple cookbooks. Uh, cookbooks. First, when I left the corporate world, uh, I was a, a food writer writing articles for different magazines. I was quite lucky. I, was, I managed to to write to um, for titles like um, Traveler, National Geographic, L, um, some important dailies here. And um, but actually, my dream was to write cookbooks. Uh, uh, and because I like, you know, when I like a subject, I want I, I want to be able to research it. I want to go uh, really deep. Uh, that's what I enjoy. So um, I as soon as as soon as I could, as as soon as I got an offer for writing a cookbook, I 
I went for it and uh, my first cookbook was on Greek food. Uh, second was uh, uh, like broadly defined oriental food. Uh, oriental uh, meaning from uh, like the Middle East and maybe even starting uh, uh, in Maghreb and uh, ending in, in Asia. Um, this is the food from the regions that I really, really like. Uh, I like visiting and I like eating this way. Um, and then also two cookbooks with baking recipes. So, yeah. Any Polish recipes in the middle? Um, not really. You know, I do not consider no. myself. And there are, there are people who are like specialists in Polish food. I have always been drawn to uh, foreign, to, to new flavors. Uh, I'm a big fan of spices. I've uh, been collecting spices for years. So um, everything that is uh, a little bit exotic uh, it, it has always been like, more attractive for me than, than like typical Polish food, which I do like, I appreciate, I eat it, I mean, it's comfort food, but it's not something that I would write about. Very good. So a lot of interesting and spicy ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, you started uh, basically as a corporate life, try to have a more focus on your food um, uh, ideas and uh, started again, as you mentioned, from the review part and then went to the cookbook. How did you think about uh, like transitioning from being an entrepreneur to supporting entrepreneurs and right, you know, starting an acceleration program? Mm, uh, this was a change that happened pretty naturally. Uh, contrary to the first one, like the moving from corporate world to writing, which was pretty abrupt and uh, I was moving to a like completely new territory. Uh, shifting from uh, having a company of my own uh, to supporting others doing their business uh, happened uh, pretty um, smoothly because as soon as uh, my website was bought by an Indian company, Zomato, in 2014, and after uh, also uh, another company of mine, which was called uh, Stolichko, which was like a table booking service, um, was uh, closed. Um, then looking for something uh, to do, I, I really didn't have to look for it because people were coming to see me, asking for advice, asking for contacts, recommendations, and so on. So uh, um, I just one day realized that I want to um, have a structure for what I'm doing, anyways. So uh, um, I want to give it. I want to give it structure. I want to give it a name. Uh, uh, I want to kind of formalize it uh, because that's something that I was doing. Anyways, and also um, uh, starting Food Forward uh, uh, created an opening for cooperation with, uh, with bigger businesses, uh, which uh, after hearing about such an initiative, uh, started getting in touch and uh, uh, started using us as a, as a platform uh, for getting in touch with like young innovators, startups and so on. Very interesting. And uh, you had a very interesting uh, TEDx talk uh, a few years mm. ago. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I try to also, do, you know, like learn a little bit and then try to understand your point of view. Mm -hmm. You had a very interesting point, especially about this point of fasting versus diet. Mm -hmm. Would you like to elaborate on that? Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, fast uh, is uh, temporary. Uh, it's not something that you can... Uh, uh, implement uh, in the for, for the long term um, uh, because it's very very restrictive. Uh, there are two kinds of fast. There is the qualitative and quantitative uh, fast. You you can combine both. Um, excuse me. Uh, so uh, um, when when you're fasting, you're basically limiting the variety of food that you eat and also the, the quantity that you eat. So you put your body under some kind of, uh, let's say, stress, which is uh, eventually beneficial for it. Um, while diet means uh, planning, for, planning your meals according to some kind of logic, but you still get to eat uh, 
um, like a not necessarily very restricted uh, um, quantity of food and also the variety tends to be much much bigger like the, the most uh, extreme version of a fast would be a water fast uh, which is when you don't eat anything you just drink water maybe water with some orange juice uh, i'm sorry not orange juice but lemon juice um, uh, slightly less restrictive would be uh, eating maybe just millet or uh, exclusively vegetables and uh, fruits uh, but also not all kinds of vegetables not the starchy ones and not all fruit like um, the sweet ones would be excluded as well um, while diets tend to um, tend to be like more easier and more also attractive and can be uh, the idea is that they can be implemented in the long term as well that's 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 like the main the main difference I'm, I'm sure it's it's a much more complicated conversation for a much more you know like a dedicated thing you know just specifically dieting and fasting but so if you want to talk about uh, yourself so are you a vegetarian or a vegan or like do you have a specific diet for yourself i am um, 100 percent vegan 90 percent of the time <laughs> So what happened to that one percent? The ten percent, the 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 remaining ten percent. Ninety percent. Oh, okay. Yes, so it's one hundred percent vegan, ninety percent of the time. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, I've been I've been trying out lots of approaches, lots of different you know ways of eating, and I first of all, first of all I found that uh, restrictions do not work uh, very well for me, mm, and. Uh, also, um, I have been studying traditional Chinese medicine for some time. And in this approach, according to this approach, um, very um, uh, strict restrictions are not, uh, are not recommended. And I somehow, you know, it, 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 uh, um, uh, it resonates with me, this idea that uh, a little bit of everything, uh, um, everything in moderation, um, is better for you than uh, total elimination. This is what resonates with me. I, it's not something that I would uh, preach or I would uh, uh, recommend to uh, everyone because uh, at the end of the day, each of us has to find what works for him or her. Um, there are people who respond well to, um, to, to, to very strict rules and who enjoy it and have no trouble doing it and who feel um, good doing it. In my case, I felt like that uh, strict restrictions were mm, not so good for my body and also uh, psychologically they were difficult for me to, to maintain, basically. So you have a very unique diet for yourself. Um, yeah, I try to listen to my body. So sometimes it's uh, asking me for uh, um, for butter, for example, or eggs. This is what uh, um, I could hardly imagine as of today, because it might change in the future, um, uh, excluding from my menu. Uh, I enjoy it and sometimes just I just crave it. But I don't, I, I think it's a craving that, that really comes from a real, like, real need, real kind of hunger, which is in, uh, which is in my body somehow. Yeah, it's not a craving, the kind of craving that makes you reach out, reach for a, um, for ice cream or uh, or chocolate <clears throat> or uh, because th th these these can be like superficial cravings, right? Uh, when I when I I feel that when I crave butter and eggs or like scrambled eggs simply. Um, mm, it is. It really says something that I I need this kind of energy that is in this food. So I just let myself have it. But otherwise, mm, I'm I'm vegan most of the time. Yeah. So, I mean, generally speaking, how do you really see the current habit of eating uh, in 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 general? You can also try to define it based on different territories because I'm sure you're specialized in that. But in general, I just wanted to know how you would really see our current eating habits. Mm, there is uh, a lot of things that could be fixed or could be uh, better in terms of our uh, eating habits, especially here in the West. You yourself, you're from Iran, aren't you? 
Yes. Okay. Yes. I would be very, very curious. I've been to Iran many years ago. Um, I would be very curious to 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 see how the food over there evolved because I have great memories of like the most wonderful ice cream I've ever eaten, um, uh, which you, you you guys have and wonderful rice dishes and so on. So uh, things are changing everywhere, but in general, uh, in the West, uh, mm, I think that we are pretty much disconnected from um, from a lot of aspects uh, of, of our lives, but food is definitely one of them. Uh, I mean, disconnected in, um, in, in the sense that uh, we are not present enough, uh, we are not focused enough, we could be focused enough, we could be more present while choosing the food that we have, um, uh, really trying to understand where, where the food comes from, who made it, what is it made from, um, is it some kind of um, sustainable and fair production and um, is it uh, also something that uh, is um, appropriate for a gi given season of the year or is it appropriate for our health? So uh, in general, I would say that we're so busy living our lives, doing the jobs that we have. And also uh, mm, we ha there are so many distractions uh, all over um that uh, uh, we are somehow on an autopilot which makes us uh, mm, choose mm, what's convenient what gives us instant gratification and um and yeah and probably no this because let's let's just stress it that right now we are talking uh, we have this we're having this conversation in the middle of the lockdown right which is happening now in poland and um i think uh, i hope this is going to be an opportunity for a lot of people to uh, to reflect a little bit on uh, how they eat what they eat and uh, what we already know from the data which is coming from e grocery and also from uh, delivery companies uh, and from this um, healthy healthy meal plans like catering uh, the is that people currently are cooking much much more at home which is um, uh, which wasn't happen happening uh, so much in the like last decade so um, Let's see. Let's see uh, what what happens when when the lockdowns uh, uh, s starts to come to an end. If we keep the habits. Of course, I mean yeah. that that's definitely the elephant in the room because otherwise we will definitely see each other face to face. Yeah. We also planned a lot of other workshops and everything around it, but unfortunately, you know, you always have to adapt yourself based on your environment and everything. But um, just again, going back to the habits that we have for, you know, like for, 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 for yesterday and today, we are still using massively on animals for the source mm. of protein. And uh, uh, regardless of uh, the fact of, um, let's just say, how much problem we put on the animals, also we still are not uh, having one specific line of thought about is eating animal even good for us or there are other alternatives that can be even better? Mm -hmm. So where do you really see yourself in this whole uh, idea? Mm, I think eating eating meat is absolutely optional for most of us. Uh, it's not something... If this is this is the question that you're asking, that like wh wh where do I see myself? What's my opinion on eating uh, animals? Or, also yeah. including, yes. I mean, it, it, is, it is the way that we all choose our food. And uh, at the same time, sometimes we choose our food because we think this is the first and the last mm -hmm, option mm -hmm, for us. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that's why as a food expert, I just thought that, you know, like you can have a better idea and better understanding of the whole scenario. Um, you know, nutrition as such is, uh, it's not perfect science. It's not, uh, it's, it, it, is a, it is a science that... Uh, um still hasn't uh, um, arrived at uh, enough uh, 
how to say it, conclusions and like uh, really certain uh, in, in information and not enough let's let, there is not enough um, evidence based uh, uh, science in this area meaning uh, it's very very hard to track uh, uh, people's um, meals on a daily basis and the ef the effect that they have and to isolate uh, the effect that the nutrition has on their health uh, isolated from other environmental and also emotional factors. So um, uh, there is a number of studies that prove that uh, in general a diet which is uh, mm, low in uh, animal protein uh, is better for your health. Uh, and these are like proper mm, scientific uh, um, experiments and proper this is pro proper scientific data evidence based so for example one of the books that uh, i would recommend to read to like anyone who's interested in the subject is the book uh, which in english was called the china study uh, which was written by um, professor uh, colin campbell uh, he did a massive research with uh, Chinese partners, scientists, and also the Chinese government participated in it, facilitated this research. Uh, and the, the conclusions, uh, this, this is, it was a large scale uh, study uh, that lasted uh, many years, uh, many decades. And it has proven that uh, the, um, the less consumption of animal protein there was, the 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 less uh, uh, cancer uh, occurrence there was in the uh, in the population. So this this was like one of the first studies that was published on the subjects, and the, there are more and more of them are uh, coming. By the way, the book has been translated into Polish as well, um, and. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, there is there is still. Um, People who will be uh, who are advocates of uh, diets who are on the opposite uh, end of this uh, of this spectrum. They would be advocating eating mostly meat, mostly uh, fat, like the old, the whole keto movement, which is extremely popular right now, and uh, whose popularity is even growing. Uh, um, it, it is a complete um, opposition. It is in complete opposition to what I just said and to, to the plant-based approach. Uh, so uh, there is science to confirm that meat is uh, optional to say the least. And um, I feel the same. And if I were to draw on whatever I learned in the traditional Chinese medicine courses, I would say that uh, Mm, there are really only specific situations uh, um, when meat-based dishes are uh, recommended uh, where, and where can be uh, really useful. So uh, meat is, we, we, we eat it out of habit. We eat it because meat is uh, like a status symbol, status symbol. And um, also... Uh, there is a lot of advertisement for uh, for meat product. There is the, for years we've been um, told that uh, protein that first of all protein is like super important in our diet and that we should um, get it from meat, uh, which is which is not true. And this is. Uh, um being con this is being confirmed by the science but also there is more and more content uh which is being published i don't know if you've seen this uh documentary uh which is called the game changers on netflix um no but uh... I would put it into you know. My, my okay, it's it's um it's a it's a well it's a well done uh, um, video a piece of content. Uh, of course, uh, you, you it's easy to say that the authors have been uh, like slightly biased because they are trying to pr to to show argu arguments mostly that um, meat is uh, not necessary if you're uh, even if you're training in a very intense way so uh, there are bodybuilders there are 
um, sports people, there are um, ultra um, athletes uh, who who are portrayed in this in this documentary and who basically show that and, and claim and, and confirm that their uh, results improved ever since they dropped meat. Uh, so um, um, there will be more and more content of this kind coming up, I'm sure. I'm a big fan of Michael yeah. Pollan books because he usually knows how to write, let's just say, to somehow in <laughs> moderation and try to be as much science-based as possible. Yeah. Uh, especially like his old book, um, uh, How to Change Your Mind, I think. So, this is like the most know. recent book of his. The on the uh, on the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. No, the other one was um, it, uh, in defense in the, of in book, the, I think, or something. Of food, right? uh, which which is where he says, yes. "Eat food, mostly plants, and don't eat exactly. anything that uh, your grandmother or great grandmother would not recognize it as food." <laughs> that also goes back again to your conversation about Iran and the habits yeah. we have there because mm -hmm. you know th this is one of the unfortunate things that I mean also another unfortunate thing on top of it is that uh, I lost my grandfather mm, almost so a year ago and uh, he also kind of let's just say had a different transition like you so he used to be in business but then after that he just uh, quit everything and then he basically just moved to his uh, uh, like um, mm -hmm. garden and all of his life he was basically growing uh, vegetables and fruits and uh, he was a master in knowing things that m me myself I always feel like there are some grasses and you have to basically throw it out but then every single one of them for him was a source of some different mm. vitamins or different things that your body needs based on different things and unfortunately I really don't think most of these things are properly well documented so you know, talking about what our grandparents know and what we don't. Unfortunately, it's one of those things that we don't really embrace nowadays. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, but uh, I am kind of hopeful that um, this lockdown thing and uh, the the austerity that it um, implies and uh, mm, the fact that we are, I think, more now. Uh, in, in uh, we're more likely to, to turn to local solutions and to um, like natural ways of doing things of sim or simple ways of doing things. I, I hope it's gonna be a, uh, it's gonna be a revival of the uh, mm, of all things natural, let's say in food in cooking and medicine and um, yeah um, it, I would say this this virus it's not um it's not so much a um, sickness it can be uh, it can be medicine it can be a, it can be a medicine it can be a remedy as well on many levels even though it's a tragic one. How do you see a person yeah. who works in a very tight schedule try to also put the cooking in their schedule? Oh well, I've been experimenting uh, with what works for me. Uh, I've it's been a, a trial and error process basically. So I've been trying to uh, to see uh, what works best: cooking in the morning, cooking in the middle of the day, cooking uh, in the evening. So um, when I was still going to the office, uh, I would usually cook um, like large quantities on Sunday afternoon, Sunday evening, and then during the week, sometimes in the evenings, also for the following days. Uh, but right now, uh, when I'm basically stuck at home, uh, so I find that cooking in the middle of the day and taking a break after the first couple hours of work uh, that I do in the morning and uh, going to the kitchen and uh, being able to focus on some manual work this is really really helpful and and, and i enjoy doing it so for the for the time being I'm, I'm doing it in the middle of the day and is there any platform or some resources that would help people especially busy individuals that they really want to cook for themselves to like have a kick start and then try to learn from that mm -hmm. place um I'm I'm trying to think what could I recommend to someone who's uh, um, who's like learning 
relearning or learning from scratch uh, uh, or starting to learn to cook from scratch. Uh, so I think that like, um, first of all, you need the motivation. I mean, you need to, you need to feel like doing something. So if you feel like uh, cooking Indian, uh, then uh, probably a good idea is to find uh, some Indian content which is adapted by someone who lives in the West. I'm giving India as an example. It's one of my favorite cuisines as well. Um, and you just find you, you just need to find chemistry uh, in the person that is uh, showing the recipes, who is publishing them on YouTube or in some kind of app. Uh, I would say find your find your person, find your man or woman, uh, uh, writer, TV host, whatever, uh, who you can relate to among all these. Uh, apps and videos uh, and and books that are available um, so it's very I think it's very personal uh, I have my go go to uh, authors uh, if I want to cook Polish which is not very often I do have a book which I usually use and uh, I have my favorite authors like one of them is the famous uh, Yotam Otolengi but uh, I'm not sure I would recommend starting with him right now, especially that he uses lots and lots of ingredients. So um, when we cannot go to the shop, it's it's a bit complicated. Uh, you would need to order from several um, suppliers. But uh, um, it has never been easier than now to learn to cook, given all the all the richness of content that there is. Does this answer your question? Oh, of course. Um, what about these startups that, uh, you know, like uh, they deliver some daily either ingredients or some food with uh, proper ingredients regarding the protein and everything to your door? Do you have any good experience? With uh, any do you solution? mean the startups that do meal kits? So they uh, deliver the ingredients and then you cook it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So as far as I know, there's yes. uh, there was only one of those in Poland, which was called Just Chopped. Uh, based in Poznan, uh, and they are currently in this uh, in the virus context. They are thinking of relaunching it because they have paused. Uh, it was on, uh, yeah, it, they have paused the service for some time, and probably they will come back with it. And um, otherwise, there are these big names like uh, Blue Apron or Purple, Purple Carrot uh, in the US. Um, which uh, were hugely pop popular at the very beginning. Um, and then they their growth uh, slowed down or even uh, they started losing some of the customer base um, because people were not... Uh, um, uh, the, the, the subscription model was probably like too... Uh, too heavy for a lot of people. There was too much commitment, but uh, they still they still operate. They still survive. I've seen um, th this kind of meal kits, which are branded by Amazon. I've seen them in Whole Foods uh, like a month ago in New York. So uh, it's still possible to 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 use it, and I think it's a great place to start for uh, for people who are um, just curious about what it's like to make a meal for yourself with your own hands and not to rely on some uh, professionals. Another one I think is also a light box that, uh, you know, I've seen them from Here? different places that they did. Here in Poland? Food. Okay. So, yes, it's lightbox.pl. I mean, it's nothing like, a, there, there's no sponsorship whatsoever. So it's just, you know, like giving a shout out to other people that they do something in the, uh, you know, Okay, in great. I personally didn't know them, so I uh, note taken. I'll take a look at them. Yeah. But uh, going to another topic also. So we have uh, veganism, vegetarianism, and uh, just say the other diets. But at the same time, we have this new uh, wave of uh, uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. the cultured meat. So Maybe first you can start a little bit about uh, telling uh, everyone how the cultured meat even, you know, like uh, would be, can be prepared. And then a person who eat that, how do, how does those, how do people have to, you know, like say what they are? Because they're not killing animals, but at the same time, they're still eating meat. Mm -hmm. 
So starting for, with the explanation of what cultured meat is, right? So uh, cultured meat is, is basically lab-grown yes. meat. So um, the process is as follows. You, um, you take, uh, or rather the people who are involved in the process, they, they do a biopsy of a living animal. They take a number of cells, which then in lab conditions, lab environment, they um, tend to uh, multiply and uh, they grow um, a tissue uh, starting from these few cells, the, the tissue that resembles, that is meat actually, but this is meat which is grown without uh, harming uh, or killing the animal and without the animal itself. Um, so uh, the process, uh, I, as I just described it just now, it may seem um, simple, but it actually is uh, quite um, demanding in terms of equipment, investment, and also um, there needs to be scale so that it's not super expensive. As of now, this the meat that is uh, lab-grown meat is uh, it's still much much more expensive than the the meat that we find uh, in the supermarket coming from animals. Mm, and uh, the the reason why the cultured meat is being produced is the mostly the the climate crisis that we are facing, uh, because like thirty percent of the Mm, uh, carbon production, uh, the CO2 production in the world, it, it's related to food production and most of it is related to uh, animal production uh, and animal produce, mm, animal products. Uh, so the, the idea behind the lab-grown meat is to reduce the impact on the environment and also to give the people the kind of the same experience as they have right now those who are really, really attached and uh, cannot imagine living without their steak or burger, uh, mm, having the flavor and also uh, all, uh, the whole experience of, of meat. So uh, those who are not interested in mm, giving up meat and also are not uh, interested in substituting it with like, plant-based alternatives, they can switch to the, they will be able to switch, that's the idea, to the lab-grown uh, meat. Okay, it can be meat, it can be fish, it can be, um, what do you call it, seafood. Um, also, there is a, it's, it's, uh, the, the research is underway uh, regarding production of uh, lab-grown milk, dairy, eggs, and so on. So, uh, your question whether someone who eats um, this kind of cultured meat, if this person is a, still a vegan or a vegetarian, it's, I mean, it's a very tough question. It's a very good question. It all depends uh, on the motives for which uh, somebody uh, chooses to be a vegan or defines himself as a vegan or vegetarian. So if you're a, an ethical uh, vegan, so you do not eat these produ products because uh, mm, you don't want to harm the animals, then you should be, I mean, it, it's all very, very personal. Let's, let's, let's keep it that in mind. But you should be able to, to eat this, uh, this, this meat um, unless uh, in the years of not eating meat, you have become disenchanted with the with the uh, whole experience with the with the texture with the flavor uh with the fact that uh, there may be blood coming out from it so mm, this is something that may happen if you haven't eaten eat, uh, you haven't eaten meat for a while right so in theory vegans could be uh partly the the target group let's say for for this kind of uh products mm. However, if uh, you're a vegan for health reasons, and uh, this is why you're skipping all the animal products, then the sculptured meat will not be a solution for you because it's it does still. I mean, it contains less cholesterol. They claim they can uh, grow it in such a way that it's less fatty and so on that it's like healthier option. But still, 
uh, it is animal protein uh, and it will have a similar effect on the body as uh, as meat, the traditional meat uh, has right now. Yeah. Good. Look, um, at the same time, we're recording this in Warsaw and Warsaw is also one of those, uh, let's just say, very... Uh, active uh, cities mm -hmm. when it comes to veganism. So I was just wondering, first of all, how did that even happen, if you have any ideas about that? And also, how do you really feel like um, we have to look at it? Like, do we have to only look at it as a health issue or this can also be somehow try to put it as uh, being more uh, pro-environment and, uh, you know, like uh, caring about everything uh, else around yeah. us? I'm interested in your opinion. What do you think? What's your what's your take on that? Because you've clearly done some research. Uh, maybe we can have a discussion on what's what's the... <laughs> I mean, for for me, the the for me, Poland is always a country of uh, like contradictions and uh, you know, like full of surprises. Mm -hmm. Let's just call it like that. So, uh, a very young economy with uh, like very fast uh, improvements mm -hmm. and everything. I really, I mean, you're a food expert. I'm more of a sociologist. But if you really want yeah. to have my sociological aspect of that, I just really feel this. Um, adoption and uh, let's just say um, as much as like maybe a lot of people who really didn't ever visited Poland properly and only know people from media and everything might say that like Poles are like not that open-minded but this approach of uh, at least let's just say the elite part of the society accepting some of those radical ideas and then try to adopt it into their um, diet I can't find anything else beside that because if we would only want to, you know, like look at how our grandparents would eat, then we would have a massive boom in uh, bar melechna and, you know, like milk bars mm -hmm. rather than vegan restaurants and sushi bars. So this is just the thing that I really see within, you know, the, the ecosystem of the, especially the startups mm -hmm. and, you know, like people that are around me, that not only they are very much interested in, you know, like uh, having a new type of diet and being more vegan or being more vegetarian. Anytime there's a new technology, everybody mm -hmm. is always sharing it and everybody is always trying to go to a new restaurant, try to try something that is, at least, let's just say, it's mm -hmm. not mainstream. So at least See, that's my So take summarizing, you would say that we as Poles, we are pretty much... Uh, Mm, open to novelty, right? That you, we like in, in experimenting, and we're yeah. eager to try new things, and um, that it's like a kind of national trait of ours. True. I mean, uh, take a look at how much uh, in Poland you will see mm -hmm. uh, hummus <laughs> that is definitely yeah. not from this region. You see sushi that is not from this region, and again, vegan that. Again, most of the ingredients, I mean, the, yes, there are lots of very good vegetables and everything around mm -hmm. Poland, but uh, you have much easier time try to have some pierogies and some tatar and then, you know, like call yourself like a happy person with a good meal rather than try to really go through all the trouble and try to be... That's vegetarian. true. We are uh, on a different, different end of the spectrum in terms of uh, openness to new food compared to uh, like Italians or uh, even Spanish people or French people who went who when they travel abroad they will the, the italians will go and find their pizzeria wherever they are no matter where they are thailand us wherever they will have they will want to have their italian food like french people if you um, read french guidebooks for discovering the world like guide du routard one of the most popular publications uh, the 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 places they recommend is the places where you can watch french tv and also have french meals while us even when if we are here i mean in poland we are really open to new cuisine cuisines and the variety that is here is uh, um but keeping things in perspective but uh, it's comparable to what happens in um, what's happening in berlin or new york and uh, the variety is really really big and uh, and it's it it changes very quickly, uh, the new cuisines uh, become fashionable. Uh, like you mentioned, the sushi. There was a time for sushi, and then there was time for hummus, and uh, 
Um, now it's the Georgian food and also the Mexican fast food uh, and vegan Mexican options. And we're really, really quick uh, to, to adopt no novelty. I mean, lo looking at the ranking, I was um, seeing that uh, according to, you know, the last statistics, Warsaw is the sixth city when it mm -hmm. comes to the, mm -hmm. by the happy cows ranking. So it's basically behind some mega cities like London and New York and Berlin mm -hmm. and Los Angeles and Toronto. So you know, maybe that is something to, you know, like to be somehow be proud of and then try to see how we can also make something even better yeah, out of this whole scenario. there's definitely something we can be proud of. And uh, when, when I travel and I look for a vegan options, uh, I always realize how blessed I am to live in Warsaw, that there is really a lot of them here. And uh, so favorite? my favorite one, I, I love having breakfasts and also go, going for lunches and dinners to... Uh, the two places in Jolibos, one is, um, they have the same owner and they are the one next to the other. There is the cafe, which is called uh, Secret Life. And uh, Usma Colonia is the restaurant, which is adjacent to it. Uh, I really lo like the, the food that they make. Yeah, I, I'm, I live on the opposite uh, side of the city, but still I will travel. Uh, I, will, I will take the, the bus and go there. And I like wow. the vibe. I like the food. Everything is right about that place. Of course, have tried I have Krava tried, Krava tried Krava Jiva. I've been uh, a, a customer uh, there from the very beginning. Uh, so I'm giving fingers crossed for them. And I see how they are growing and uh, they are now present in delivery. And by the way, if you use all these platforms, the delivery platforms, like Pishna, Vault, Uber Eats, and Glovo um, slash Pizza Portal, the number of vegan options, uh, how it's growing, it's really impressive in delivery also. I really hope that, you know, the supply and the demand would just meet properly. That's hopefully by, you know, like podcasts like this and other sources, like even the Netflix and everything else, people would try to understand the, you know, mm -hmm. the differences between their choices and then also try to see how much by eating healthier they can have a better mm -hmm. quality of life and work mm -hmm. and try to really Are invest in this. So I am, let's just say, okay. I'm, I'm very much like what you said. I, I mean, just to, not to go even too much into the, you know, like back and uh, the future. So like even today, even though I had a really busy day in the beginning, in the morning, I started making some uh, mushroom soup for myself. So let's just say mm -hmm. fully vegan and all the other stuff. But from time to time when I'm outside and, you know, like um, there are other opportunities, I don't mind eating almost everything that as long as this is not my diet. This is just, uh, you know, like something that, you know, mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. I just say it's a social part of my life. So I'm I'm still trying to be more, let's just say, um, socially responsible and then try to, you know, like maybe say no to these things. But for the time being, I really feel, I, I, I think you also mentioned it from time to time that being moderate and then try to also I gradually adopt myself with all these things. That's how I try to mix all of those mm -hmm, diets mm -hmm. and then try to I make understand. my own diet. Yeah, out I can totally relate to this approach. Yeah. Uh, we definitely share it. And uh, you mentioned a very uh, important thing here. Um, if I understand correctly, you said that like the social occasions are are when uh, are, are the times when you're most likely to. Um, to be like off course uh, in terms of vegan eating, that, that you you will you will go with the flow. You will eat what your friends are having, uh, uh, whatever. Yeah. So I it, it, this is exactly, exactly the same thing with me. I mean, I um, I think it would be putting too much stress, uh, too much stress, too much pressure on myself if I was to stick to this one hundred percent. Uh, plant-based uh, lifestyle um, uh, also in social occasions because it's it, I, I feel excluded when I change the diet I, I really enjoy eating uh, whatever is there on the table and sharing the meal with everyone um, as much as I can yeah 
Also, there was a um, very, like to say, controversial comments also mm -hmm. uh, around the impossible whooper. That uh, it, it is true that something might not be yeah. uh, meat-based, but junk food and not being meat-based are not always the same thing. So when you put too much salt and then you overheat things or you try to add some ingredients that are not mm -hmm. exactly, you know, like in line with your health, it doesn't really make you a healthy uh, person by eating that. It just makes you a person who did not eat meat. And also it would be good to get your take on, you know, like how well people have to go to make sure that not only they eat Uh, you know, like a specific uh, line of products, but at the mm. same time, keep themselves healthy. The answer healthy is and uh, whole foods, plant-based lifestyle. So uh, it's not enough to be plant-based slash vegan. Uh, you're much better off if you're on a whole foods, plant-based diet. Um, uh, meaning you pay attention. I mean, you make you make it a point to eat whole grains unprocessed food because as you mentioned impossible burgers or other burgers or um, the the um, all the all the alternatives they are heavily processed and their um, the list of ingredients is way too long and way too complicated so um if, if you want to i mean the best thing that you can do for your health is to is to go whole whole foods plant-based and whole food means basically unprocessed so um, for example i mean i know that none of us has mm -hmm. a crystal ball in order to see the future but uh, do you really feel a hundred years from now where hopefully we're not going to destroy our planet and we're still we're just going to have uh, mm -hmm. you know like most of the things that we have today Do you really feel that uh, still we would have uh, this uh, attitude of uh, killing a cow and just keeping them, you know, into some confinement of, you know, like not even being able to move just for the sake of keeping them fat and, you know, like I think killing it will them happen. and getting I their I think meal? it will happen much faster than in 100, 100 years. Uh, I think... Uh, in like 20 years from now uh eating meat will be frowned upon and as uh, the way it, the way smoking is now in public places and um the the way our consciousness uh on a global scale is changing and also our awareness is um, bigger and bigger in terms in terms of how, how we treat our other species and how we treat the the, the mother earth or the planet uh, i think the changes will be much much faster and I, we will stop doing the things that we do now and uh, you know the science science of the, of this are coming already from the european union right so the the it was still before the pandemic which uh, has caused an increase in prices uh, of meat Uh, by itself, but even before the pandemic, the European Union was already working on a kind of law that would uh, basically make the prices of meat uh, more realistic in terms of uh, reflecting the whole environmental cost of uh, of the meat production, which is not being the case right now. Um, I also spoke to one of the Uh, people who uh, who are involved in developing uh, scenarios for the future for the food industry and um, according to him like one of the very uh, likely scenarios that the EU is working on is that in 2020 there will be no more industrial production of uh, of meat in the European Union it will be based it will be technically uh, legally uh, forbidden to have uh, the farms that we have right now mm, and uh, if we want if uh, in 2050 if we still want to have meat we would have to import it from other parts of the world uh, so uh, wow. mm, it will be more complicated quite possibly it will be more expensive i think they will, will they will make sure that it is more expensive uh, I, i think it's quite likely that meat will be taxed the way uh, Mm, alcohol and tobacco is 
And um, um, I think we're realizing we really don't need it. And it's something uh, um, that served humans uh, for a part of our history. But this is uh, being obsolete. This is becoming obsolete. The only difference between meat and the tobacco is that we really don't need tobacco, you know. But even if we just want to, you know, like like the taste and everything, we still have those cultured meat. And even we have this very interesting Polish startup, Kurczak, that, you know, like it just shows that we can mm. make those things happen without hurting animals yeah, and definitely. then have Absolutely. all those things, right? So... Yeah, just, uh, you know, some, let's just say on some final notes, because, you know, like when somebody's foodie, then there are science behind it, then there is a story behind it. But on top of that, there are also some, let's just say tips and uh, some interesting things that might uh, help some other people try to get your flavor and then, you know, mm -hmm. like maybe even enhance their foodie life somehow. Uh, we're just wondering, uh, what is your favorite oh, cuisine? Oh, there is uh, there is not one. Uh, it really depends on my mood and on the season. Uh, I have a, 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 I have a couple of those. So Indian, as I mentioned, I like Indian food a lot, and um, it, it's it's uh, it's a blessing when winter comes and I need something colorful and and warming and uh, northern which region India. of India northern is India. the one you yeah. like most. Uh, uh, no, Kashmir uh, and um, Uttar Pradesh and yeah, but basically northern India. Uh, some dishes from the south as well, but uh, but my thing is uh, is is rather the north. Um, otherwise, um, I do like a Greek food a lot, but uh, I think uh, I have this. You know, I, I can say it half jokingly. I have this theory that actually my family comes from the Middle East. So uh, yeah, um, <laughs> uh, when whenever I I am to cook something without a recipe, like I look at the ingredients and uh, I uh, I am to just make something to it. It's always Middle Eastern meza and uh, uh, Middle Eastern dishes, basically. Yeah. Okay. That's that's very interesting. The first what was ever the first, uh, uh, dish you cooked. I remember these were pancakes, which I made. Yeah. Uh, and I made them with potato flour. Uh, so they came. No, naleśniki. Uh, and they came out uh, terrible okay. <laughs> because potato flour is basically you know it's starch. So uh, <laughs> they were it were like they were like gummies. Uh, like, uh, <laughs> You could you couldn't break it. Uh, you have to tear it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but still, that made you a foodie person. Been, so yeah. that, yeah, that was something good. I made it for myself and for my parents, and they pretended they were okay. So maybe the first encouragement encouragement worked, and uh, this is what kept me going. Because you mentioned that there are lots of news outside, mm -hmm. but not all of them are very much science-based. If you want to give one or two sources for people to find more information about food industry, where do you really feel uh, they have to go and find Food industry and nutrition are like two different um, areas, right? So for food industry, for like the novelty, what's going on, what's happening in the world, uh, my favorite websites and newsletters are edited by the spoon.tech or uh, food connect uh, both of these websites um, are um, uh, updated by, by by teams that also organize uh, events uh, which i can highly recommend as soon as events uh, are um, are allowed again uh, but in terms of nutrition it's a it's a very tough question um i would i would go i would start with this um colin campbell's book and then take it from there uh, he mentions a lot of uh, doctors that he works with and also i like the approach of uh, a, a podcaster uh, i don't know if you know him his name his name is rich roll so he uh, he is uh, on a plant based whole foods plant based uh, diet uh, lifestyle and he's also uh, an athlete. Uh, he was—he's a former lawyer who, at the age of 
I think 44 or something, changed his he changed his career and uh, basically focused on 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 fitness and health. And he he has a very very good podcast with lots of uh, um, guests uh, who study nutrition. Uh, like Neil Barnard was one of his latest guests and he was explaining how our hormonal health depends on uh, what we eat so uh, yeah this is one of the sources as well perfect and uh, in case mm -hmm. people want to get in touch with you regarding your acceleration program or some advice you can contact me on linkedin or uh, you can drop me an email at ola at uh, foodforward.vc so i'll be happy to 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 talk to uh, all these innovators and ha people working on new projects Well, it was a very, very interesting conversation and a pleasure to having you on this podcast. So thank you very much uh, for all the insight and all the information. Hopefully people are just going to get this information. Let's and, hope for uh, that. And thank you for having me. Happier, Ahmad, better uh, life. Merci, as you say in Iran, right? Uh, and thanks for organizing this uh, podcast instead of the uh, actual meeting. So looking forward to meeting you soon. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for also after this whole thing is going to be over. Have a good day. Thank you everyone for listening. Hope you enjoyed this conversation, learned something about the food industry and how to become an entrepreneur in the food industry. There were lots of new trends and we learned how to live healthier while eating exactly what we want and eat responsibly. And I really hope that would make a big difference for you and uh, you would be a happier and healthier person in your life. We're looking forward to hearing your feedback and hopefully we'll have more podcasts coming soon. Tell us who you really want to be interviewed and at the same time, stay tuned. Thank you for your time and stay curious. Mm -hmm.